Tonight has been very different than this morning. There's a lot of energy in the room, a lot of excitement. You guys seem happy to be together. It may be a little early to say this, but I think we're on course to have the very best team camp ever. That's just a prediction. My name is Walter Evans. I serve as an evangelist and elder for the Greater Philadelphia Church of Christ. We've been in Philadelphia 23 years now. I've served in all kinds of different capacities and regions, way back to the old West region in Philadelphia that then became the city West region in Philadelphia that then became the Midtown region in Philadelphia. And now I'm serving in South Jersey. South Jersey. We went there because they have a beach. Philadelphia doesn't have a beach. Jersey has a beach. We can go to the shore. I'm an old surfer. It's great to be with you guys. And I just want to say it's a privilege. You guys are inspiring. Today's been awesome. Tonight's been amazing. We had the president here. We had Bernie here. We even had that other guy, Trump. Uh-oh. I don't want to start anything. We're not political. Even though the city of Philadelphia right now is inundated with politics, it's great to be a camp and away from all that. Amen? You know, I'm excited to speak to you, but I realize what I'm up against. I'm an old guy, and you're a bunch of young people. I know. But I got to tell you that being with you guys makes me young. I get excited about the future of the kingdom, what's going on, and seeing your lives and hearing the stories and hearing. I heard Dan Fithian this afternoon. He preached the word to the men's class to see Cain Pierce up here leading, singing, to have Joel just share his testimony. A lot of good stuff going on. And, you know, I'm kind of coming up on my 40th spiritual birthday. August, August 27th will be my 40th spiritual birthday. 40 years. That's as long as they wandered in the wilderness in the Old Testament. But, you know, although it's been 40 years, I started studying the Bible when I was a teen. My decision to get baptized to make Jesus Lord came in my teen years. And I got to say, after 40 years, I don't regret one minute of it. You guys are in for a wild ride. God's got great plans for you. And it's exciting to be together and just have the vision and dream the dreams. Before I get into my message, though, I did uh, want to just take a minute. And I think I'd be remiss without saying that we owe a lot in terms of camp and what goes on around here to my most awesome wife, Kim Evans. I'd like to have her stand up. Stand up. If it wasn't for Kim, a lot of things wouldn't be happening around here, and she really does take uh, a lot of time and puts a lot of heart into making sure that things run well and that you guys are taken care of. So if you see her walking across the courtyard or whatever, just run up, give her a hug. She'd appreciate that. All right, tonight we're going to talk about being victorious. This is going to be a happy, feel-good message. I promise you that. Now, you're going to have to do a little soul searching in the middle, but I think by the end of this, you're going to be encouraged, especially one person in particular, but we'll get to that. Have you ever got a trophy? You ever won an award? Raise your hand if you won an award, if you've got some trophy in some closet somewhere, if you got your name in the paper, if you won that softball tournament, that little league thing, in the third grade, the the cake walk or whatever, you got a trophy for it. Feels good to win, doesn't it? Feels good to pour yourself into something, to work really hard, and to be victorious. But you know, sometimes we get to win, and we get to enjoy the victory, when we didn't even have a whole lot to do with the victory. That feels good too, doesn't it? Where you, where you get to enjoy the, spoil, the spoils of the victory. You get to enjoy the benefits, the fruits of the victory. And you didn't even have to try that hard. You know, I live in a little town called Villanova, Pennsylvania. 
And when the Wildcats there at Villanova won the national championship just a few months ago, I went out into the streets with all the students and I celebrated with everybody else. Maybe not quite in the way that some of them were celebrating, but I had a good time. I said my zip code is 19085. I live in Villanova. I'm enjoying this celebration. I didn't take one shot. I didn't even go to, I maybe went to two of the games. I, I, I don't even know the players. And yet I enjoyed the victory. Sometimes it just happens like that. Your city, your town, the team that you cheer for, they win something and you get to claim it as yours. You wear the gear, you put on the shirt, you got the hat, you say, yeah, this is my team. Look at what I did. Look at what I, what I get to enjoy when really you didn't do a whole lot. You know, that happens in the Bible too. Let's go over to Joshua chapter 6. The Israelites are on the move. This is an exciting time in the history of God's people. But there's an obstacle that needs to be overcome. It's not a little podunk town. It's a city called Jericho. And Jericho has a big old wall around it. And they're very proud of the fact that nobody gets in unless they let them in. Joshua chapter 6, verse 1. Now, Jericho was tightly shut up. By the way, if you've ever wondered if you should be able to say shut up, it's in the Bible. It's right there. Shut up. There it is. Jericho was tightly shut up because uh, uh, of the Israelites, no one went in and no one came out. Then in verse 2 it says, The Lord said to Joshua, See, I have delivered Jericho into your hands, along with its king and its fighting men. March around the city once with all the armed men. Then do this for six days. Have seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horns in the front of the ark. And on the seventh day, march around the city seven times. When the priests blow the trumpets and you hear the sound and give the long blast on the trumpets, have all the people give a loud shout and the wall of the city will collapse and the people will go up every man straight in. Pretty crazy plan. That's not really how you're supposed to conquer a city. We've all seen the movies. They got flaming things they shoot over the walls, and they got troops storming the gates, and they got arrows being shot from the top and all this kind of stuff. None of that was going on. God says, I got a different plan for you. It's going to take you about six days. You go around, and you march, and you don't even have to be that close because you get too close to the city, they throw stuff at you. And so they kept their distance, and they quietly just did the loop. And then they did it again, and they did it again, and then they did it again. On the last day, they went around a bunch of times, and they gave a shout, and they blew the ram's horn, and the walls just fell down, and they were victorious. It's pretty cool. In chapter 6 and verse 20, just like it says, the trumpet sounded. The people shouted, and at the sound of the trumpet, when the people gave a loud shout, the wall collapsed, so every man charged straight in, and they took the city just like God said they would. You know, sometimes God's plan seems a little silly. I mean, we don't say that out loud, do we? But it's like, that's kind of different. That's a little weird. I don't really understand that. Maybe you've thought about that even in terms of baptism. You ever think about it? Getting fully immersed in a tub of water, in a river, in a lake, in the ocean that that's supposed to help you and get you where you need to be and you go from being lost to being saved at that point and you get to go to heaven? That's a little crazy, right? That sounds a little... Uh, I, but you know what? God said it, and that's all that matters. God told the Israelites, this is how you're going to defeat Jericho, and that's all that matters. And they did it, and it happened. What do they have to do? Not a whole lot. They had to do some walking. They had to bring some guys along that had some, some horns, some trumpets that they could blow. And then when the time was right, they just had to give a shout. They got a whole city for doing just that. That's not very hard at all. 
Sometimes God gives us stuff even when we don't really do very much. That's kind of cool. You know, in a world where we got to really grind it out most of the time, how many of us work hard at school? Raise our hands. Yeah, that's what I thought. You're a pretty studious bunch. A few of you kept your hands down. We can talk later. <laughs> but, you know, most things in life you've got to work hard for. You've got to really dig in. You've you got to put your time and your effort in the sweat of your brow to reach your goal. But sometimes God says, you know what? I'm just going to give you something. I'm just going to shower some blessings on you. You know why? Because I love you. I love you. That's really how God feels. He says, you don't have to earn this. I just love you. I care about you. And I want to give you something special. It's not our talents. It's not who we are. It's not what we've achieved. It's just the fact that we have a Father in heaven that loves us and wants to give. That's pretty cool. Let's look at a picture here. That's little Austin. You've probably seen him around camp. There's his dad. There's his mom right there, Audie and Bethany. It's my grandson. I got to tell you, being a granddad is not overrated. I love being a granddad. I love hanging with Austin. I love doing things with Austin, and I love doing things for Austin. And you know what? I'm not the only one. Gigi, grandma, does the same thing. Audie, Bethany. Audie's mom drove here from Ohio to be with little Austin. Do you know why? Because we know Austin's going to grow up and be a rocket scientist. That's why we're doing this. No. We know he's going to be an extraordinary athlete when he grows up, and he's going to get all kinds of scholarships, which is going to make Dad happy. That's why we do what we do. He's going to be a rock star, an entertainer. No. We don't know any of that, do we? And actually, at this stage and age, there's no way that we can tell. So why do we shower gifts? Why do we love Austin? Why do we just want to be with him and hold him and encourage him and watch him laugh and smile? Because we love him. Pretty simple, right? Pretty easy. We got to get it in our heads that God's the same way with us. All right, we got to say goodbye to Austin now. He'll be distracting. Tonight, my only job tonight is to get you to realize that God wants to give you good things simply because he loves you and because you're special and dear to him. Jesus talked about it. Look over at Matthew chapter 7. Jesus spent a lot of time talking to the Jews, and the Jews had a lot of laws and a lot of reasons for what they believed and how things were supposed to work and all that kind of stuff. But in verse 9 of chapter 7, Matthew, Jesus says, Which of you, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Did you get that? Jesus says, if you, though you're carnal would be another word, if you're flesh, if you're evil, if you're just of this world, even though you're imperfect in what you do, you know how to love your kids. You know how to make people happy. You know how to give good gifts. How much more? God in heaven. Why do we have a hard time believing that? Why do we have a hard time believing that there's a God in heaven that looks at us and smiles and loves us 
and is excited about blessing us and encouraging us and giving us good things like a parent would do with a child. Go to the end of the Old Testament or the New Testament, 1 John. And once again, as John writes this in verse 1 of chapter 3, John says, How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. I love that verse. You ought to, ought to underline that one. The love that God lavishes on us, that we can be called children of God, that we're in the family, and that we ought to hold our heads up high and go, and that is what I am. I'm a child of God. I'm in God's family. Or at least I'm working to get into God's family. I want to be there because it's a loving God. It's not a duty-bound God. It's not a, just a law-abiding sort of relationship. It's the fact that God loves us and wants to lavish his love on us. But sometimes we have a hard time receiving something for nothing. Isn't that right? We get a little uncomfortable just receiving good gifts. Sometimes we even feel a little bad. And so we're going to try something tonight. Hang on just a second. What I have here are three brown paper bags. And in each one, there are numbered tickets. Okay? Okay. We got a bag for each column here, so there's three rows of seats, and there's enough tickets for all the campers, all the teens, to get one ticket. Now, there's not any tickets for staff or for the counselors, but only for the campers, okay? So if we could just start these around, once again, each column gets one, just pass them around. They're all mixed up, okay? You don't have to worry about if we run out of some in one area. Then uh, we'll just pass the bags over to the other area. But just pass them back. Everybody, if you're, if you're a camper, you get one ticket. Just take one. Just one number ticket per camper. Should be enough for everybody. And after you take it, we'll, we'll deal with that at the end. Just hang on to your ticket. So, the premise tonight is be encouraged. God loves you. He wants to give you good things. Amen? You guys with me? So what gets in the way of that message? Satan. Satan gets in the way. He really does. Satan wants us to feel like losers, not like winners. Let me say it again. Satan wants you to feel like a loser. Satan wants you to feel bad about yourself, about who you are, about how you look, about ways that you've messed up. And he is working on a daily basis to tear you down. Nod your head if you agree with me. You feel that pressure? What do you say in your head about yourself? And that's a good question for your groups a little bit later on. What goes on in your head? You don't say it out loud. I did it, I did it yesterday. My car broke down. I was having a hard time getting to camp. I was getting frustrated. And I made a mistake. And I don't even remember what the mistake was. But I remember saying in my head, Walter, you're an idiot. I just said that in my head. You're an idiot. Do you say stuff like that in your head? Do you listen to those voices that go on in your head and make you feel bad about you? Because they're in there, aren't they? You know what I'm talking about. I don't think it's just me. I'm not just hearing voices. You're hearing voices too. And they're not good voices. They're not encouraging. 
You know, the world tries to get us feel bad about ourselves, and we, we second-guess ourselves, and we feel like, you know, I wish I was different. I wish I was somebody else. Do you ever feel that? Even at camp, sometimes we can feel that way. You know, last night was great having everybody out in the field and playing games in the dunk tank and all that sort of stuff. I'm still working on my attitude towards Audi, but I'll get over it. But, you know, even when we come here sometimes, we get insecure about how we look or how we come across or who our friends are, who's cool, who's not. And, and we start playing, playing kind of negative tapes in our head, in our mind. You know what I'm saying? You know, we can do it about even how we look. You ever do that? I'll give you an example. Here's a picture of me. Okay? That's me. Nothing special. That's what I look like. Take it or leave it. That's me. But you know, when I start thinking about me, sometimes, and, and people said, you know, you ought to be more jovial and encouraging. And I think maybe because I've got kind of a narrow head, narrow face, that, um, you know, maybe, maybe that's what, what people, and, and I start kind of playing it in my mind to where I start getting kind of this weird thing of, and then, and then sometimes I hear, you know, you ought to smile more. You know, they did that thing at the ACR conference a couple, yeah, which was really hard to do. You know, I, 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 I was told to sit there and not smile. And they just picked on me and got me up on stage and all that kind of stuff. And I think, you know, really, I ought to, I ought to work on my smile. So, there, there, you know, there's another strange-looking thing there. Uh, and, and so, after a while, you start thinking about yourself so much where you start kind of getting this grotesque picture in your head about what you look like. And, and it really messes with you. You know, we got to stop that. And we can take that down now. But I'm, I'm pleading with you guys. You got to stop the thoughts. You got to stop letting Satan in. God's saying, man, I want to open the, the floodgates for you. I, 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 I'm like a dad or a granddad with a little kid. I just want to play and encourage and lift you up and, and build you up and make you happy and, and give you good gifts. That's God. And that's all right there tonight waiting for you. The, 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 the dam is about to break. It's full of good things just overflowing, ready for you, for your life. And, and, and if you could see it, you'd jump on it in an instant. But we got this thing in the world. And the world says, don't believe it. You're messed up. You know, there's a guy in the Old Testament that felt this way. Let's go to 2 Samuel in chapter 4. And, of course, for those who are familiar with the Old Testament, one of the primary characters, of course, is King David. And David starts off as the shepherd boy, and as we heard about today for the men, he defeated Goliath and he rose to power and fame and became the king and overthrew Saul and Saul's army, and they all fled. But we read in 2 Samuel in chapter 4, in verse 4, one of David's best friends, a guy by the name of Jonathan. It says in verse 4, Jonathan, son of Saul, had a son who was lame in both feet. He was five years old when the news about Saul and Jonathan came from Jezreel. His nurse picked him up and fled, but as she hurried to leave, he fell and became crippled. His name was Mephibosheth. Five years old. Your family is running for their lives. Your nurse, caregiver, gathers you up and in her haste drops you. And you were crippled from five years old for the rest of your life in both feet. Mephibosheth. What was he up against? First of all, he had a terrible name. I don't know if they just called him Chef or 
Mephib or Bo or whatever, but Mephibosheth is hard to say. He had to live with that name. But not only that, he didn't have a dad. Jonathan was a pretty cool dude and one of, one of David's best friends. And David and, and, and Jonathan pledged their commitment and their support of each other. But his dad was killed in battle. Let me just speak honestly to those of you that are brought up in families, maybe with just one parent. That's hard. And it weighs on you, doesn't it? And it tears at your, your heart. And you want to feel like, why me? How come I don't get to have a dad? How come I don't get to have a mom? How come my family's so jacked up? How come my, my dad's gone off to prison or my mom's a drug addict or I don't even know who my parents are? And all those sort of things go on in our minds and make us start feeling negative and feeling bad things and feeling like a loser. Not only did Mephibosheth not have a dad, but he had a crazy grandfather. I mean, his, his grandfather, Saul, was a lunatic. Ended up, towards the end of his life, uh, going with fortune tellers and, you know, even called up uh, Samuel the prophet from the dead in crazy passages. I mean, you can imagine the stories that were circulating about Saul, Mephibosheth's grandfather. But then on top of that, and, 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 and along with the family issues, he was crippled. He had to deal with a real legitimate physical limitation. Physical limitations wear on us, don't they? And maybe we're not crippling both feet, but we wish we were a little taller. We wish we could run a little faster. We wish we were as cool as that guy or could play basketball as good as him or as attractive as her or could dance like them or whatever, you know, all those sort of things. The Lord is good. Thank you. I don't like to drop the Bible, but when it comes to the Bible or my tablet, the Bible can take it. But, you know, physical limitations, they tear at us. We, we feel bad not being what we want to be physically, and once again, it happens, doesn't it? The negative takes start playing in our minds. We start hearing those negative voices. We start feeling like a loser again. And it wears on us. Satan's loving that. He wants you to feel that way. You know, this first six months of this year, I've had to watch a brother in Christ deal with physical limitations. My best friend in the Philadelphia church that's not in the full-time ministry is a brother by the name of David, well-known physician, took care of a lot of members of the church as well as about a 1,000 people in the community. And back in January, he got blood clots to where they affected him and he had a stroke. But they also cut off the circulation in his legs. And both his legs were amputated above the knees. I watched Dave Strickland go from a point of having a thriving life with a great practice and active in all kinds of things to where he was never going to walk on his legs again. That his practice would need to be sold because he would not be able to perform medicine the way he was before. That the house that he lives in, he can't even go upstairs. He hasn't been upstairs for six months. I mean, all these things have weighed <clears throat> on my friend David. And yet, with heroic faithfulness, I've watched him week in and week out fight his battle to not give in to the negative thoughts, to not get into the feelings of, I'm just a cripple, 
I'm just physically limited. I can't go on. I just need to resign and accept my place in life. Some of you are close to resigning. Some of you have heard the voices so loud from Satan that you're never going to make it. You're never going to measure up. You're never going to be good enough. You're never going to fit into the picture. You're never going to be the cool kid. And you're really close to giving up. Let's look at Mephibosheth again. Back over in 2 Samuel in chapter 9. And this is such a cool story here because Mephibosheth has left and lived in exile. But as King David comes to power in verse 1, it says, David asks, is there anyone still left in the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now, there was a servant of Saul's household named Ziba, and they called him to appear before David. And the king asked him, are you Ziba, your servant? He replied, the king said, is there still no one left in the house of Saul whom to, that I can show God's kindness? Ziba answered the king, there is still a son of Jonathan. He is crippled in both feet. Where is he, the king asked. Ziba answered, he is at the house of Makar, uh, son of Amel, Lodebar. So King David had him brought from Lodabar, from the house of Makir, son of Amero. When Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David, he bowed down to pay him honor. David said, Mephibosheth, your servant, he replied. Verse 7, don't be afraid, David said to him, for I will surely show you the kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan, I will restore to you all the land that belonged to your grandfather, Saul, and you will always eat at my table. Get this in verse 8. Mephibosheth bowed down and said, What is your servant that you should notice a dead dog like me? He'd been listening to the voices. He'd been beat down by the world. He'd resigned to the family, to the fact that his family was forever going to be the bad guys. That he was going to live in exile, that he was never going to amount to anything. And then King David rides in. It says, hey man, not only am I going to restore your life as it was. You can have back all the property. You can have the wealth of your father. But you're going to sit at, my king's, at the king's table. And be like one of my sons. How cool is that? He went from being a street beggar and a cripple. To eating at the king's table. He went from hearing the voices and feeling bad about himself. And resigning his life. To now being able to dine with the king. That's God's plan. We've listened to Satan long enough, amen? We've given in to the insecurities and the doubts and the fears, and we've been put down by the world and kicked around enough. You know, the world came up with a strategy to make us feel better about ourselves. It's called love yourself. You're familiar with it. It's the only resource the world has. It's if you're feeling bad about yourself, then just love yourself. And you know, it even comes out in our music. Like back in my generation, there was a song that was sung by Whitney Houston called The Greatest Love of All. Here's a little clip. All right, there it is. There's the answer, folks. Learning to love yourself is the greatest love of all. Sounds pretty cheesy, doesn't it? And you can say, yeah, that's because that's your generation. Oh, yeah? Well, let's listen to another clip that uh, is a little more recent. Go ahead. All right. 
Don't just give it to me on my generation. You guys do it too. What's old Megan Trainer telling you? Hey, man, if I was you, I'd want to be me too. I just love myself. I'm so awesome. Right? That's the world's strategy, right? Just keep telling yourself you're awesome. What does that lead to? Arrogance. You know, walking around with a big chip on your shoulder. You know, not letting people get in because you don't want to let anybody mess up your dream because you're everything. You're awesome. That's the way the world teaches it. That's messed up. Don't go there. It's not about, oh, I'm just going to love myself and keep telling myself every day that I'm awesome. Look at, look at what I've done. Look at all the great things that I've achieved. You know, somewhere down deep, you kind of wonder in those songs if it's really just a desperate cry. You know, there's got to be a better way than just me getting up in the morning saying, okay, regardless of how I feel, I'm awesome. Okay, I, 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 I'm, I'm having a tough time in my relationships or I'm running into struggles here. I'm not doing well at work or at school, but I'm still awesome. Isn't it better? When someone else thinks you're awesome? I like that approach a lot better. I like that a lot better than having to love myself. I like it when somebody else loves me. You like being in love? Raise your hand if you've ever been in love. Let's see. Let's see who's bold enough. Bold enough to raise those hands. Come on. There it is. Oh, even some of the brothers. We got a double hand over here. My brother from Canada. <laughs> All right. We like being in love, right? There's nothing wrong with being in love. It's a good feeling to be in love, right? It, it, it makes your heart skip a beat. You get excited about seeing that person. You can't wait. You stay on the phone a little too long. You got a 4,100 texts back and forth. It's like you can't stop. It's just I'm in love. Being in love's great. But you know what's really cool about being in love? It's great loving the person. But I tell you, when I fell in love with Kim, I was having fun being in love with her. But what really fired me up is she loved me back. In fact, she seemed to get excited about me. She seemed to like me. Back in the day, I was known as Wonderful Walter. That was me. She thought I was wonderful. I could, that blew my mind. Nobody ever thought I was wonderful. At least I don't think so. Maybe my mom. And then here comes this beautiful lady that thinks I'm wonderful. Oh, that feels a lot better. If I just walked around all day having to convince myself that I'm wonderful, that's ridiculous. But that's what the world tells you to do. It's a lot better when someone else thinks that. Here's the kicker. That's exactly what God thinks about you. That you're wonderful. That you're awesome. That... You don't have to go around convincing yourself. You just have to go, hey, God thinks this about me. That's a lot better. That feels a lot better to wake up in the morning and go, you know what? God thinks I'm awesome. God loves me. Now, I understand we got our sins to deal with, and he doesn't like that. But you know, it's like raising kids. They mess up. They got to change. They got to deal with stuff. That's fine. But you always love them and think they're awesome. And that's what God thinks about you. God wants to give you good gifts. He wants to show you great love. He wants to lavish his love on you in abundance. He wants you to feel like Mephibosheth who was a cripple, beggar, on the run, and in exile, and now got to eat at the king's table. Don't you want to do that? Doesn't that feel a lot better? That's what God wants for you. So to close and to make the point, you've all got a ticket now. And 
I've got the corresponding numbers to all your tickets right here. We're going to have a drawing. But it's for only one person. And this one person, if I draw their number, will get to go first in line at all the dinners from here on out for the rest of team camp. All right, first in line. Even if you got to go back, you get to go to the head of the line all the time, every dinner from here on out. You guys good with that? That sound pretty good? Shall we draw? Wait a minute, let's, let's do a little more. So first in line, that's a good thing. You know, first in line, that's kind of how God thinks about you. You know, God loves everybody in the whole world, right? But God loves his people and lavishes gifts on them first. Do you know that? You ever see that in the Bible? There's even some funny passages where in Romans, Paul says, and God does not show favoritism, first for the Jew and then for the Gentile. You go, wait a minute. That, that sounds like favoritism. And that's true. In the early church, they believed that you should take care of the poor all around the world, but let's make sure that we take care of the Christians first. That's how it was done in the early church. And so God wants us to be first in line. He wants everybody to have a meal. But he says, hey, you get to go first. So there you go. That's what you can do. If I pull your ticket first in line for you, every dinner from here on out, head of the line. But let's help the ante. How about this? If I choose your ticket, not only do you get to go first in line for all the dinners, but on one morning during this teen camp, I will bring you the beverage of your choice to your cabin, cup of hot coffee, nice cold drink, something to wake you up in the morning so that you just feel awesome about the day. You all right with that? You okay with that? All right, we ready? Ready for the drawing? You know, let me just say, that's, that's how God wants to do it too. God actually wants you to start your day with him. You know, when you get up in the morning, he wants to greet you. He's fired up about you. He wants you guys to connect, to have that early morning time together. So our way of demonstrating that, cup of coffee, a hot chocolate, cold beverage, your choice. One morning here at team camp brought to your cabin by me personally. Good? Okay. Let's, let's up the ante again. This is a state-of-the-art, zero to cool by cool design, battery or electric-operated 10-inch portable fan, still in the box. It's two speeds. It's compact in its design. It's got a carry handle, batteries, and an AC adapter. If I pick your ticket, not only do you get to go first in line, not only will I bring you the beverage of your choice to wake you up in the morning so you can be refreshed, but much like God, your physical needs will get met too. You will have, in the hottest week ever of team camp, your own personal fan. And you may say, I already have a fan. Let me tell you, two fans are better than one. All right, we ready for the drawing? All right, first in line, cool beverage, hot cup of coffee, and a fan. 
God loves you that much. God wants to bless you with good gifts. God wants to take care of your personal needs. God wants to greet you in the morning. God wants you to be first. But you know more than anything, God wants us to go to heaven. Right? We get to spend eternity with God in heaven. And so I got to thinking, how can we demonstrate that at teen camp? What would be a little taste of heaven at teen camp for one person that gets their ticket drawn? And I thought, 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 you know, even maybe just a little break from camp, a little getaway. And I thought, that'd be nice, and then maybe the person whose number got drawn, they could bring a friend, someone else from team camp, just one, two people in total, And maybe of the other gender. Who knows? Just saying. God loves you a lot. God loves you and wants you to go to heaven. Wants you to bring other people with you. And so... For the person's ticket that I draw tonight, not only first in line, not only a beverage in the morning, not only your extra cool fan to help you sleep at night, but on Friday from lunch period through the afternoon, the person's ticket along with a friend of their choice will get to go to the movie tavern to enjoy a movie in air conditioning and watch a film. I will drive you there personally. I will chaperone the event. Cool air, movie tavern food, a film of your choice. Are you guys ready? Before I draw the ticket, What's the point tonight? God loves you. God wants to bless you. God wants to give you good gifts. Here we go. It's a long number. Two, three, one, nine. We good so far? Eight. Not there yet. We got two more numbers. Two. And the last number, and the person can come up and see me, and we can work out the arrangements, is the number nine. Who is it? Do we have a winner? All right, guys. We're happy for Elias. (laughs) He looks a little shell-shocked. All right. Please don't miss the point. That's how God wants you to feel. That's what we need to realize about God's love for us that he does desire to give us good gifts. Let us tonight in our groups talk about that. Talk about what gets in the way, and let's talk about the voices, the things that go on in our heads where we tear ourselves down and feel bad about who we are. 
We're going to close with a prayer, and then I'll turn it back over to Audie. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for you. Father, we get beat up by the world, and we get thinking all kinds of crazy things. And I know in this room, some of us have been dogged with negative feelings and just feeling bad about ourselves. Father, thank you for your love, that it's unending. Thank you for your grace and your mercy, that even as we mess up and we sin, that you still love us. Yes, you want us to repent and to change, but you're always going to love us. Father, help us to enjoy that love. Help us to be grateful. And help us to really reach out to those around us as well. We appreciate tonight. We love you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's hear it again for Walter. An incredible message that we don't need to listen to God's or to, to our negative voices in our head, but instead that God actually loves us so much that he wants to lavish us with his love and his internal salvation. I just have a few announcements before we go back to our cabins tonight. Um, one is that if you have medications, please don't forget to get your meds before you go to sleep. They're important. We need to take them if we need to take them, okay? So don't forget.